Good morning. How is the keynote? It's awesome, yeah, Rich is awesome. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's great to be back in person, right? Don't know how you feel about that. Two things I didn't think I'd miss, airports, and I was in Porto two weeks ago, and conference coffee, and we've got a lot of that here, so awesome. Um, so what am I going to be talking about today? So uh, I'm going to tell a couple of stories first, I think, just to illustrate. Um, illustrate sort of the, the sort of, I guess the, the background behind what I'll be talking about, which is building the Millennium Falcon. Don't worry, you haven't come to the wrong thing. I'll be talking about Lego, Star Wars, a bunch of stuff like that. Mainly lean product development. Uh, and how lean product development uh, works to effectively build software. But I'll tell a few stories first. So the reason I put this talk together some time ago now, probably 10 years ago, uh, which is why this is a redux version of it, what I've learned since I put this talk together, was, well, so at ThoughtWorks, the company I work for, software consultancy, we did some work for Lego. I think there's some people from Lego at the event, so I don't know if there's anyone in the room. If you are in the room, if I'm misrepresenting anything, I apologize. We did some work for Lego. It was quite interesting work. It wasn't myself, it was two of my good friends and colleagues. Um, and back in the day, there was a Lego MMORPG, so a massively multiplayer game in development. And of course, this is aimed at children. Uh, you know, children playing, playing this Lego game. And there was a performance issue with this Lego game. In fact, a very particular part of this Lego game. So if you're, you know, uh, if you're familiar with the sort of Lego computer games, what tends to happen is you walk around smashing things and finding secrets and collecting bricks. This game, what you could do is make a thing in your clients. You'd be able to collect all this stuff, and then you could make your own structures, make your own houses in your client, client side, and then it would be sent off and rendered in the real world. So then everyone who was playing the game would be able to see your fantastic creations. Now, the cynic in me thinks that they might not have thought that through. Because what they ended up with is a really big performance issue with their genitalia detector. And that's actually true. So, you know, what, you, what you're going to do when you've got all this Lego, a lot of people try to, you know, troll everyone else by building rude things. And it turns out it's quite hard to do rude thing detection at scale for a massively multiplayer online role-playing game or online game. So they asked us in to go and have a look at, their, at the game and some performance issues with it, and we helped them out. And as a thank you, oh, incidentally, my two colleagues stayed in the Legoland Hotel in Billund. And this is kind of an interesting, like, you know, you're, you're a soft professional software engineer, you wake up in the morning and you've got this, like, in, massive, like, you know, kind of ice cream focused breakfast and loads of kids running around. Very odd experience for them. But they're in this hotel, and of course, part of the hotel is this giant shop. And as a thank you, they sort of said, Well, I'm going to have a look in the shop, see what you might like. And at the time, the set that I'll be talking about was the largest set that Lego had ever made, the Millennium Falcon. And they said, Oh, we quite like that. And sure enough, two weeks later, in the Thoughtworks office in London, the Millennium Falcon Lego set turned up, which is very nice of them. And so that's what today's talk is about. It's the story of building that. But I'll tell you some, uh, a couple of other sort of anecdotes first, all related to Daniel Turhurst North, who's speaking next door at the moment. So if you get bored of this, he's pretty good. You can always go next door. Um, so Dan introduced me a long time ago, probably 2007, 2008, to uh, a guy called Don Reinertsen and his work on a book called Principles of Product Development Flow. I was a sort of wee nipper. We nipper, we sort of, you know, um, junior dev back then, sort of, I was, you know, late, mid 30s, something like that. And I, this is, I read this book and it was sort of really interesting. It's all about how work gets done, the, you know, the importance of managing queues and batch sizes and cycle times and Little's Law and all this sciencey stuff, the economics of product development. And I thought that's kind of interesting. And then about 10 years later, I managed to go to a conference in Australia where I met Don Ronaldson. And on the way, I reread the book. I had 24 hours on the flight. I reread Principles of Product Development Flow. And it absolutely blew my mind. So that's the first thing. First recommendation get Principles of Product Development Flow. It, it, it's, it's, it's a fascinating um, description of why what we do when we do things like lean product development and agile. That sort of thing, why it works. Fundamentally, the economics of it. I and mean, if, you, if you've ever, ever had to um, convince 
management or you know, finance people or whatever it is <coughs> about why we do the things that we do, economics is always a good way to go, I find. Follow the money. The second thing Dan North also introduced me to was Conway's law. So Melvin Conway, you know, back in late 60s, I think it was, uh, he wrote a paper which came to be known as the mirroring hypothesis and then Conway's law. So this talks about how software architectures that we build, the software designs that we come up with, they mirror the team structures of the people who come up with those designs. I'll be talking a bit about this on Wednesday morning um, as well in my, my second talk. And then again, some years later, after I'd had a bit more experience, I was at a, a symposium and Mel Conway was actually there. He was actually in the room. There's about 20 of us. And so I got to meet Mel Conway. And we got to talk about you know, the importance of his work over the years and how um, the way team structures do, in fact, you know, influence software architecture and the other way around. And so that's the sort of background behind what, I'm, what, what I'll be talking about today. The deep mathematics around kind of information flow, how information flows through hierarchies and through value streams and these sorts of things. Um, but I'll be doing it, hopefully, via the medium of lean uh, of Lean Lego, building the Millennium Falcon, and hopefully that'll be interesting and fun. So what, what am I going to talk about? I'll talk about Lego, I mentioned that. I'll talk about Star Wars, because you can't talk about the Millennium Falcon without talking about Star Wars. And I'll be talking about flow. But if, like me, you're wondering who the hell this guy on stage is, I should probably introduce myself first. So I'm this guy, James Lewis. I'm a director at ThoughtWorks. Um, I, I'm a software engineer, I'm a software developer, I still write code, still hands-on. Um, I'm sort of the guy behind microservices, so apologies for that. And the most recent work I've been doing is on patterns of legacy displacement. Uh, in brief, whenever you talk about legacy, you know, migrating away from legacy code or legacy systems, everyone always says, we use the strangler fig pattern. Everyone nods sagely and says, yes, we'll use the strangler fig pattern. And then they go off and they say, what the is a strangler fig pattern? So what we're trying to do is come up with a catalogue, if you like, of patterns you can use, like real world concrete patterns, or patterns based on concrete real world examples of migrating away from legacy systems. That's with my two colleagues, Ian and Rob. And just in case my Lego, adult friend of Lego, for that is what I am, credentials and the fact that I've got a Chewbacca thing at home, don't convince you of how much of a geek I am. This is me with my son at Warhammer World in Nottingham. So we went there as well recently, it was great. Go there if you like Warhammer. So we'll just do a quick recap on Lego. Has anyone in the room not played with Lego? No, we're all good. There's normally at least one awkward, awkward person who's gonna, but we're good, okay. So recap on Star Wars, and I appreciate not everyone has watched Star Wars, so there are gonna be some spoilers in this. Um, so episodes one to three, Frankly, we don't really talk about episodes one to three. They don't really exist if you're a Star Wars fan. Um, I mean, there's different orders you can watch things in, but if we just forget episodes one to three in general. Episode four, well, the synopsis of the plot is this. Boy realizes he can do magic, falls in love with a girl, evil sticks to the evil empire, kills some dudes, etc. Oh, incidentally, has anyone ever thought of the, the stormtroopers? All these stormtroopers just get annihilated. There's like tens of thousands of people. Do. I'm not sure if, it's, if they're the good, good guys or the bad guys anymore. Episode five, boy's mate gets frozen. He learns how to do magic rather than just knowing about magic. Finds out his dad runs the evil empire. Now this sucks, right? Episode six, boy understands he loves the girl he fell in love with as a sister, which is handy. Few will kind of be, oh, that was kind of lucky. Uh, boy fights dad, dad fights boy, boy beats dad. Oh yeah, there's a whole thing. Dad beats the old cackling guy, cut to party. And that's where, when I originally wrote this talk, things ended. But then a few more things happened. Episode seven, girl re real, the girl realizes she can do magic, falls in love with the boy, sticks into the, I mean, something bad happens, etc. Episode eight, the boy is back, except he's old and grumpy now. And he you know, drinks weird milk made from blue puffin stuff, juice. Um, and it turns out that one of the major characters dies and Leia, oh, not Leia. Episode nine, wait, what? He was like totally dead. I mean, he was electrocuted, but no, the emperor from the first series of films is back and um, yeah, we'll move on from that. That's essentially Star Wars in a nutshell. Uh, pretty much you've got one to three we don't think about, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine, which are the same as four, five, six, except 
with different numbers attached. So presumably that's all clear. The next thing is a brief recap on flow, lean product engineering, flow. What do I mean when I say flow? I mean the flow of stuff, the flow of information, the flow of value, the flow of ideas, the flow of raw materials, the flow of um, knowledge. What we do as engineers generally is we, we think about it's knowledge work. We're managing the flow of ideas from my, my former MD used to say soup to nuts, concept to cash. What Dan North says, you know, lead time to thank you, which I quite like. So that's really what the rest of this, the this, this sort of sciencey bit behind this is about. It's about flow. It's about taking stuff that's ephemeral, raw materials, and progressively developing them in value until you get something that you can sell or that is useful to someone. That's my definition. Yours might vary. So now prepare and witness the firepower of this fully operational conference talk. A long, well, it wasn't a galaxy far, far away. It was an office far, far away. We'd taken delivery of this Millennium Falcon box. Uh, and this, this is the story of us building it. Episode four, a new box. If you've not seen one of these giant boxes, the giant boxes of Lego, now these cost hundreds and hundreds of pounds, right? The new one, there's a newer version than this, it's about 600 pounds, I think. The ATAT, which is their biggest set so far, I think is 800 pounds. They come in boxes now with wheels on the box. That's, that's actually true, right? You have to drag, you can pull, they're so heavy, you have to have wheels on the box. 16 and over, right? That's what uh, the recommended age for, for building one of these things. And it's got 300 double-sided page manual, which is quite a lot of manual. Over 5,000 pieces. And back in the day, Lego just used to put all the pieces in the box. So it's all of them in the box. This is the team that uh, I'll be talking about. Me, my friends, Alex, Seema, Alex and Andy. We found ourselves on the beach one Christmas. In Thoughtworks, because we're a bit hippie, we don't talk about being on the bench. Feels a bit mean. We're on the beach, which sounds all nice and fluffy, but it's the same thing in between projects, right? In between working on clients, right? And one Christmas we thought, we've got a couple of weeks. We've got all this Lego knocking around. Let's see, let's, let's build it for a laugh, you know? And there is a serious side to this, which is, as I said, the lean product development perspective, right? The, the ideas behind flow. So um, I'll explain a bit about this stuff now. I appreciate some of you will already know what these tools are or how these tools work or probably use some of them already. But hopefully there's a couple in here that maybe are new to you or uh, you won't have used um, as much as some of the others. The first thing is a Kanban board or a story wall. Everyone use a Kanban board, story wall? Anyone not use one of these? Yeah, there's some people who don't. So, you know, fundamentally, what is a story wall? What is a Kanban board? Well, to answer that question, you have to, I think we should ask ourselves, what's the difference between what we do as product engineers in the digital space, knowledge workers, versus actual engineers or the manufacturing domain? What's the difference between the manufacturing domain in terms of flow and inventory and things moving through systems versus what we do? The difference is, what we, what we work on, that work is invisible in general, right? It's ephemeral, it's in someone's head until it's written down in a business requirements document, or if you're lucky, turned into a set of nice vertically sliced stories. All a story wall is, is a mechanism for making inventory visible, right? That's all we're doing. If you're the manager of a factory, it's quite obvious to work out if you've got piles of stuff of inventory lying around, right? You've got a machine and there's a load of stuff in front of it. That's inventory. Inventory, bad, right? We want to carry as little inventory as possible. Or you might have a pile of stuff after it. Again, inventory, inventory, bad. You can see this when you're looking around a factory. This is why in lean, uh, in lean manufacturing, we talk about we're trying to reduce inventory just in time, delivery of stuff, of products, right? So while we're talking about, you know, um, single piece flow, a single item moving from beginning to end of a process. All a story wall really does is it makes the stuff that's already there but ephemeral visible. So we can make decisions about it. We can understand how much inventory we're holding, what the holding cost of that inventory is. All right? 
how much stuff we've got sitting around waiting before it starts making us money. Because that's what all these things are, you know, there's stuff waiting to make us money at some point in the future. And on the story walls, you tend to have a number of things, swim lanes, we have a series of process steps that work flows through. You know, in what we do, it's like ready for development, in development, ready for QA, in QA. In a manufacturing, it's going to be ready for widget A to be built, widget A being built, machine time, etc. So we have these swim lanes, for example, ready for development. In ThoughtWorks, we also tend to talk about burn up charts, not burn down charts. So a burn up chart is where you track the total amount of scope you've got to deliver for an MVP or for you know, minimal viable product or whatever it is, and you burn up the scope to that line, to the total scope that you've got. Scrum tends to, or used to, talk about burn down charts, where you burn down from total scope to until you're finished. Our experience, I don't know if it's the same as yours, scope tends to go up. It's much easier to track scope increasing and decreasing when you burn up to it than you burn down to it. Now this is where it starts to get a bit more interesting, a bit more project management-y, a bit more lean manufacturing-y. Cumulative flow charts. So who's come across a CFD finger chart? Got a couple of people, one, okay. So a cumulative flow chart is where you take a burn up chart and rather than just, just track work completed, you break out all those swim lanes into their individual component parts. Well, why is that important? Well, what you see with cumulative flow charts is you start to see the depth of queues. You start to see how long it takes a work item before it you know, enters in ready for QA and exits it. How long is work sitting around waiting for a particular part of the process to happen to it? So you start to be able to identify bottlenecks more easily. You start to be able to Right, look at these things and say, all oh, right, well, we've got lots of stuff waiting in development, ready for development. Like maybe our BAs can slow down a bit and help somewhere else or something. Value stream maps. There's lots of hands up here, sorry. Maybe we'll do the other hand instead. Who's come across a value stream map before? Shaking heads. No hands going up. So value stream maps, they originated with with lean manufacturing. And what, what value stream maps show is quite simply the process steps that a thing has to go through in order to accrue value and then be delivered. If you think about a build pipeline, your build pipeline is a value stream map. It's the physical, it's a physical implementation of going from code commit through into production, right? The value stream map going through testing and so on. But you can go further up the chain and you can think about where requirements come from and plot a value stream map all the way through into production. This is a very useful tool that we use a lot when I'm consulting. And you can use event storming if you've come across that as a really good way of creating value stream maps, not just for exploring domains. What this is saying, simply, is you've got three stages where activity is happening. One is taking three days, one, one and a half, one half. So what's that? That's three, four and a half, five days worth of value adding activity going on. Maybe it's three days of development work, one and a half days of testing, half a day of deployment. In between the value adding activity, you've got these waits, these wait times, where work is sitting around incomplete, or maybe complete but not making money, for periods of time. I guarantee if you look at your value stream map for how you do work or your organisation works, you'll find these really long wait times, where stuff is just sitting there, waiting for something to happen to it. A lot about optimization and systems thinking and lean optimization is about understanding what your system looks like and optimizing your system. But you can't do that until you make the system visible. Because all the work is invisible, right? And next, I won't bother because this is the least obvious one, control charts. So rather than plot cumulative velocity or cumulative points delivered on a burn up or a burn down chart, what you do with this is you just plot the average number of points delivered per iteration per sprint, right? And then three sigmas, three standard deviations either side of that is essentially the, the, the system variability. So three standard deviations either side, any, any, any sort of velocity that is within those standard deviations, that's just the natural variation of your team, of the program that you're on. So maybe you're doing five points one week, you're doing 10 points the next week, then seven points the next week, right? You should probably expect your points range the next, the, the, the week after, to be somewhere within that range, right? 
And if it goes up to 15 points or down to zero points, it's outside your control limit. And therefore, what you can do is investigate why. What, why, why have we done zero points? But if it's six points, well, it's just a natural variability of our system. We don't need to investigate that. Yeah. Incidentally, three sigmas either side is six sigmas. That's where six sigma comes from, the name of the, the lean methodology, six sigma. Comes from three, three sigmas either side. I promise you Star Wars though. So episode five, the Lego strikes back. So what do you reckon we did? We opened this box, there's five of us, it's Christmas, maybe it was four o'clock in the afternoon and it was like wine time, don't know, maybe. We got really super excited. We looked at the instructions, like woo, and we all just jumped into this thing, right? We just started like woo, Lego going everywhere. I was really excited. Yeah, we all piled into the box, we all got bits that we identified from the manual, and we all started putting the bits together. And the problem was it went really, really slowly. It was taking us a long, long time to get anything done. And if you plot the value stream for building Lego, it looks a bit like this, right? You've got finding pieces for the next thing to build, and then you've got putting them together, right? And then you move on to the next step, then you move on to the next step, much like a, well, any form of uh, product development process. And the problem was it was taking us ages to, to find stuff. Quite a short period of time to put them together, but ages to find stuff. So that's tip number one. This stuff is invisible, right? As I sort of said, knowledge work is invisible. The first thing to do is understand the system you're working in. And generally that, make, that means making the process, making that system visible using tooling. And what we were doing is, turns out, we were processing work serially. Everyone was like really excited looking for stuff. And then everyone was really excited putting stuff together. So work was just flowing through one at a time like that. So tip number two. Use Kanban boards and story walls, whichever your flavour of Agile Stroke Lean is, to visualise how work is flowing, to visualise work. So the result of all this, the Lego striking back, was a burn-up chart that looked a bit like that. End of day one, we were going to finish about the heat death of the universe. Now, you know, I work for a consultancy. We're not really supposed to be on the beach for that long. Ideally, we're supposed to be out billing and earning money. So we didn't have until the heat death of the universe in order to, 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 to work on this thing. Boo, sad face. You can tell how old this is, it's kind of pre-meme. It's like back in emoticon days, this is how old this talk is. Episode six, the return of the process Jedis. So what happened is we sort of naturally, and this did happen genuinely, we didn't use all these tools and applied these tools afterwards to visualise what happened, but we did actually do all these things in this talk. A funny thing happened, we moved from everyone doing one thing, right, everyone doing that, everyone finding pieces followed by everyone assembling pieces, wait for the animation, <laughs> we moved from that to having some people work on one stage of the process at the same time as some people worked on a different stage of the process. And you can see this illustrated in this picture of us at the time. Some people were sort of finding stuff, some people were putting stuff together. So what did we do here? Well, I guess naturally we sort of identified that there was a constraint. It was taking us a really long time to identify pieces in the box. Right? Taking us 10 minutes to do that and we elevated that constraint. We dedicated people just to doing that. This is from the theory of constraints. If you've come across, well, more, I guess, recently the book, The Goal uh, by Gene Kim et al. Sorry, Phoenix Project by Gene Kim et al, which is a rewrite of The Goal by Eli Goldratt, um, which is where the theory of constraints comes from. What you'll understand from that is the idea is any process, what you should do is look to identify where a bottlenecks are, where bottlenecks are, once you've visualised your process, once you understand how the work is flowing, understand where the bottlenecks are, and then you subordinate everything else to the bottleneck. So you make the bottleneck as, you know, go as quickly as you can. And once it's going as quickly as you can, you move on to the next bottleneck. So we identified this bottleneck of finding stuff, and we subordinated ourselves to that by finding stuff, by having dedicated people finding stuff, uh, and then dedicated people putting stuff together. So using the theory of constraints. 
That's my next tip. Use the theory of constraints. So, next up. Fundamentally, principles of product development flow, product development, is about queuing theory. Right, all of the things I'm talking about now, we can describe mathematically using queuing theory. Right, we can talk about items entering queues and leaving queues. We can talk about MN queuing processes, right, where you've got things going in at the rate of M and coming out and blah, 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 computer science 101. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about queuing theory. Whenever we're performing work in work, we're using queuing theory. So do you remember what you learnt in CS 101 about queues? Essentially what we did is we started to identify queues in our, in our process. We started to be able to, well, the people finding bits started queuing them up in advance of people putting stuff together. So we identified based on the pages of the manual, basically, you know, these different steps and the people would be finding stuff and putting them in a queue, putting them in the queue, putting them in the queue. So the people who were putting stuff together could just pick stuff off the queue, pick stuff off the queue, pick stuff off the queue. In the same way that when we are in work, if I'm a BA, I'm writing a user, user story maybe, and I'm adding that to the ready for development queue. And as a developer, I'm going to be picking work up off the ready for development queue and put it in, putting it in potentially to a ready for QA queue. So we visualized a queue in the system based on the pages in the manual. Essentially, there was a natural set of queues that we could use. So the folks assembling pieces pulled from the queue and the folks finding pieces pushed into the queue. So that's my next tip. By identifying queues in your system, you can it basically aid you in maximizing throughput because you can by managing the depth of queues and we'll come to this in a second queue depth is directly related to throughput queue, queue depth is actually a leading indicator for process cycle time overall cycle time so when you're looking at your you know your jira backlog and you've got three thousand items in that jira backlog right or whatever product development tool you use if you've got something that's sitting at like 2999 in that queue that's going to take a very, very long time to progress to the top of the queue and pop out into the next queued stage, right? So this is why we talk about things like working progress limits. This is why we talk about looking at queues and understanding the depth of queue because queue depth is directly related to throughput, directly related to your cycle time. You can do things like, you know, um, basically you can, if you measure queue size, you can predict what cycle time is. You can measure it mathematically. That's little all. So that's the next tip. Identifying queues in your system, you can aid in maximizing throughput, making sure that you don't have so much stuff just sitting waiting to go, to go wrong in your queues uh, basically means that you can reduce your cycle time. So there's a sidebar on this. I, I mentioned queue size as a leading indicator of, of, of cycle time. Um, and what we normally do is we think about, okay, we think about if we've got a long cycle time, we identify we've got a long cycle time, and then we work to reduce it. But, but queue depth is actually a leading indicator for that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that now. So uh, is everyone here on the Slack channel? Yeah, there was a question in one of the, one of the hallway chats or something like that from someone who'd not been to a conference before, looking for some advice and tips. And one of the tips was, I thought, you know, there was some really nice stuff in there, like, go and, go and speak to the speakers because they, they're people too. And, you know, they're not just weird um, people standing on stage. And they like to have a chat and talk to each other because, you know, that's what, we, what we're here for. But there was a very practical note in there, which was about lunch and about how long you have to wait at conferences for lunch. I don't know if anyone saw this. Now, say lunch is at one o'clock this afternoon, right? And, you know, there's a uh, lunch is served at one o'clock. Right, you've got a rate at which hungry people are going to be leaving talks and arriving at the tables for lunch, to eat lunch. Right, so we've got like maybe these, uh, maybe at the start we've got a bunch of people who weren't in the talk, the, the, you know, the talk that's about to finish, so they're just going to lunch and just eating, that's fine. But then suddenly the, 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 the talk before lunch finishes and a ton of people, 400 people turn up at the tables. Right? So you've got this big queue builds up, massive queue of people just standing there hungry, at the same time, pretty much the rate at which you, people can be served lunch is constant. 
the whole way through. Right? It takes a fixed period of time, more or less, for someone, give or take error bars, for someone to put some salad on their plate, maybe some pasta or whatever it is, move on to the next bit, etc. Then they're out. So it's just a pretty, pretty, pretty predictable, sort of pretty predictable length of time it takes to actually perform that value adding activity, which is feeding people. So when you've got a graph that looks a bit like this, which essentially means you've got a bunch of people sitting in a queue waiting for lunch, the sessions finish. How do you work out if you've got a problem? What you, what you could do is you could wait until one, half past one, when the rate of people leaving has got halfway through the rate of people arriving sort of thing, but you, you only find out you've got a problem at half past one or one thirty-five. But if you, just, if you just, just measure your queue depth, suddenly I went from no people in the queue to 300. Oops, I probably need to do something. This is what Tesco and Sainsbury's and all the supermarkets do with um, checkouts, right? If there's no one waiting in the queue, they only have two or three checkouts open. If suddenly there's five or six people queuing up, ding dong, all available staff to the checkouts, please. People just suddenly turn up at the checkouts and start processing the queue faster. They manage queues, they don't manage how long it takes you to actually buy your shopping. Of course, if the... Uh, in the Slack channel, there was a, a point being made, which I'll come to later. The point being made in the Slack channel was actually NDC's great because there are, there's, there's food available the whole day. Right, so you don't tend to get this picture in NDC like you do in a lot of other conferences. And I'll come back to why that's important later because we could also ask the question, as well as what would LEGO do, what would NDC do? But by doing all this stuff, essentially, we got quite a lot faster. Um, I can show you that on my burn-up chart that we happily created after the fact. Uh, we went in, in terms of hours now rather than heat death of the universe. So we started to track that we could in fact finish this before starting on a new project or going on holiday again. Jeez, so that's my next tip. Use burn-up charts and yesterday's weather uh, to track progress. Yesterday's weather is the classic thing from, um, from Agile. You know, there's the, the sort of af aphorism that, you know, Today's weather is 70% of the time going to, going to be the same as yesterday's weather. So if I predict what my velocity is this week, 70% of the time it's going to be the same as it was last week. Within, variable, within those, the variability, of course. But that's not, what, that's not where we sort of ended up. Other fun things started to happen. We didn't really stop there, right? The team became T-shaped. You've heard about T-shaping, presumably, you know, generalizing specialists, personally, I'm an expert in, I would say, server-side Java development, probably distributed systems, that kind of stuff. But for about four weeks, I can probably pretend to be a BA, probably. All right? I've been around them enough, I've done enough of that stuff over time that I can you know, fill in the gaps if I need to. I'm never going to be a great QA. My brain doesn't work like that. A great, you know, exploratory testing is not my thing. I'm not, I'm not good at it, but I can fill in if we need to, if a team needs me to. And that's kind of what happened with the team building the Millennium Falcon. We became T-shaped. So we got some folk who became sort of specialists in putting stuff together, and some folk who became specialists in finding bits and pieces. And you can kind of see how that might work with Lego, right? You've got this big Lego set. It's quite complicated topologically. You know, so actually, if I'm spending all my time putting stuff together, then I'm going to get quite good at it because I can kind of see how the evolution of the thing is happening. Similarly, if I'm looking for bits the whole time, I'm going to get better at looking for bits. Oh, I just saw that little yellow head a minute ago. I'll go back and find it over in this bit of the box. So you became sort of specialists. But both of whom, both sets of specialists, could turn their hand to the other specialist's role. It turns out, you know, everyone knows how to build Lego, which is quite nice. Not everyone knows how to do product ownership. I certainly don't. And then another funny thing happened. These specialists noticed something else was happening. So this is a control chart. This is the length of time it was taking to find a piece in the box. And it was all over the shop. So our queues were sort of growing, and then they were shrinking again, and growing again, and shrinking again. Sometimes the people find, you know, assembling stuff were just so sort of nothing to do. Sometimes they were just flat out because they had too much to do. All right. Big variability in our product development cycle. Because it turns out that when you've got a whole bunch of pieces in one place, finding one of these pieces is a function of pretty much two things. How many of them there are and how big they are. 
right? So it's easier to find uh, a big piece and there's, when there's lots of them than one small piece when you've got 5,000 pieces, right? So we started doing this. The people finding bits started just in time lumping similar bits together. So we started creating sort of little bits of inventory that were the same. So we knew where to go to get stuff. It's like, you know, if you've got you know, 10 machines all making widgets, you don't put all the widgets into one big pile. You have a number of different piles of widgets. So the, the next set of process steps can pick the, the, the bits of widgets in that they need. That's the next step, the next tip rather. Because the, the effect of this, of grouping like bits together, was to reduce the variability. Right, we massively reduced the variability and the length of time it took to find a piece. But what we didn't do, crucially, is invest all the time up front sorting all the bits into their individual components. We optimized over time. So that's my next tip, tip six. Use control charts to identify variability and then work to reduce that variability. When we're doing product development, we can track the way our velocity pings about. Right? Three sigmas either side, that's natural, but we can still work to reduce the amount of variability you know, or increase velocity, if you like, over time. So some other fun things. This is actually, this is a real thing. As in, a lot of this is post hoc. This is, we actually did this whilst we were building. We, we started creating defects, so we had bugs. Um, you know, we got, you know, the page number, the step on the page, whether it's critical or not. So we had critical and non-critical bugs. You know, critical was it was necessary to continue you know, for structural reasons. You had to like pull the analog cord, stop the line. Everyone went and found that bit, looked to find the bit, like you do. You know, swarming around a bug, right? But we also had non-critical bugs, which were kind of, you know, kind of more cosmetic things. They could be put in a bug track, and we quite often we sort of go, oh, that was that bit I was looking for. We'll find it a bit later on. And we ended up with working progress limits. So we started to limit the queue size in front of the people putting bits together. Now, the, any, any ideas from what I've been saying about putting bits on the manual? How we might have a, a sort of natural working pro progress limit? Are you still awake? I might, don't make me get you all to stand up. Like, this is like not a, I'm not that kind of presenter. Well, it turns out you've only got so many process steps on each page of the manual, right? Before you have to turn it over. So you could only have the work in progress limit up to the number of steps on one page, because if you turned it over, it would all, all the pieces would disappear and you'd have to start all over again. So that was our natural whip limit. And we also swarmed around bottlenecks. As I said, generalizing specialists. If the queue depth got too big, then the people finding bits would stop and they'd help putting stuff together. Similarly, if, you know, and on called can't find a bit, we're blocked, the people putting stuff together will help with finding bits, swarming around common problems. So another tip, limit work in progress, and then we pull more work from upstream. That's a crucial thing. We always go upstream when we're swarming. You know, we look to see if QA is blocked as a developer. If, as a BA, we look to see if development is blocked, not the other way around. We don't keep pulling work from the ready for me queue. We go the other way. And the blue line shows that we actually accelerated and we actually delivered our project within the time frame we had available by using all these tools and techniques. Woo, chew at home. See, this is the bit that does have memes. So this is the, the later bit, right? That's what it looked like. Oh, the unicorns. That, that's what it looked like in the end. It's this big set. It's about that big. It's a huge thing if you've not seen them. There's a Lego store just in uh, uh, Piccadilly Circus. They've got them there. And unicorns. So what are my conclusions so far? This is based on, you know, something we did as a, as a group for fun 10 years ago. And I thought when thinking about it, and we were talking about it in the office, that it might be useful as a set of learnings to share with people about lean software development, about agile, that kind of thing. But why the stuff we do works. And as I say right at the start, you know, 
Back then, I read Don Ronaldson's book, and it was kind of interesting, but I was really into TDD and Agile and, you know, as a coach and XP and all this kind of stuff, which was really exciting. And 10 years later, when I reread Principles of Product Development Flow, it blew my mind away. I realized that actually a lot of this stuff is fundamental to not what not just what we do, but pretty much to how pretty much every single process and every organization in which you work works. That's what my talk is about on Wednesday. But what are my conclusions so far? So the first thing is this understanding your system. Work, the, the stuff that we do is invisible. So the first thing to do is understand the system in which we work, make that system visible. Right? Use things like value stream maps, use system thinking tools. Visualize work using things like Kanban boards. There's a reason we do them, we do this. It's not just because a PM said so, or because we're following Scrum or Safe or XP. It's because they're useful tools, right? They're useful, useful ways for us to understand how work is happening within our system of work. Look to identify constraints in your system. Use the theory of constraints. So look to understand where bottlenecks are, work to you know, reduce the bottleneck, and then you know, understand that there's always going to be a bottleneck. You're never going to eliminate bottlenecks. So then find the next bottleneck, whack-a-mole, next bottleneck, whack-a-mole, and so on. This is a process of continuous improvement based on feedback. But also understand the limitations of the theory of constraints. The theory of constraints was constructed as a view on how to optimize the manufacturing process, the lean manufacturing process. It's based on the idea that machines are the bottlenecks. Machines tend to only do one thing. They take raw materials and turn that into a widget. The widget goes to another machine, which is turned into, which takes other widgets and turns it into a product. But the machines are only doing a single thing. There's a story in, um, in the goal. Uh, Eli Gold, Eli Gold writes Gold. It's, a, it's quite the famous sort of example, really. He talks about a scout, a scout troop. How to optimize a scout troop getting from A to B when you've got people that walk at different rates. And there's one individual in this story, one scout, who's maybe a bit less fit than the others, also carrying a lot more stuff. And they're going really slowly. And this guy keeps like lagging at the back and dropping behind and dropping behind. So how, do you, how do you optimize that process? Well, in, in the goal, in the, using the theory of constraints, you, you basically work out why that person's going slowly. Okay, well, they're carrying lots of stuff. Take that stuff, give it to someone else. Distribute the, the, the weight around, right? They're still going quite slowly. Okay, we'll understand that maybe we should all then work, work at their rate. That's another classic thing from lean manufacturing. You only go as fast as your slowest machine. So you queue all the other scouts up behind them, and then you all arrive at your destination at the same time. Now Don Reinertsen, in his book, Principles of Product Development Flow, he points out the flaw in this, which is that humans are not machines, it turns out. Humans can do multiple different things. The scouts don't all just have to wait for the one scout who's the slowest. You could send some of the more experienced scouts on ahead. Maybe they could make a campfire. Maybe they could get some, some bottles of water for tea or look for wood or whatever it is. You know, we get to do different things than, than the machines that are described in, in theory of constraints in the, in the goal. So understand your system, use the theory of constraints, but realize we get to do different things like swarming, taking on other, pe other people's work from time to time, and come up with different ways of solving problems. Queues, work in progress, and swarming, these things all help keep throughput high. We're talking about how to, how to increase the flow of work through our entire system, not just one, one process step. Just because I'm really, really going fast in my development team doesn't mean that upstream or downstream we're going really, really slowly. Dan North has a great line where he says, Dan Turner's North, um, where he says, you know, it doesn't matter if your development team is infinitely fast. If it takes you six months to define any requirements, you're still going to take six months before you make any money. So understand the system that you're in, not just the bit in the system that you're in. And then this idea of yesterday's weather, tracking progress, burn up, and variability. So that's where I was a little while ago. Seven, eight, and nine. Like four, five, and six, but, but newer, as I said at the start in my recap. Oh, hi. So this is the only time I've ever been able to expense Lego. I went and expensed this thing because I wanted to understand, like, I wanted to do a redux around this, what I've learned since, what I've learned in those sort of 10 years. What have Lego learned in those 10 years? So I went and I expensed some Nexo Knights Lego. It's not my favorite product line from Lego, but hey, you know. 
And I asked myself the question, if you were Lego and you were also constantly learning from building Lego sets, what would you do? What would be the change that would have the biggest single impact to the Lego system of work? And that's a question for the audience. Sorry? Organize the pieces. Steps on the back, yeah, you could do that. More, 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 more work in progress, right? Organize the pieces. I'm going to do that thing. You organize the pieces. Because at the start, we talked, I talked about, you know, the Lego box. And, you know, back 10 years ago, they used to just have all the stuff in one place, right? All the Lego pieces. You'd be like, searching through them all. And we ended up sort of just in time moving to this idea of grouping bits together. So another science bit. This is from Principles of Product Development Flow. The batch size queuing principle, reducing batch size reduces cycle time. The single biggest thing you can do to improve throughput in any manufacturing or software development or you know, product development process is reduce your batch size. If you do nothing else, you don't have to add people to a team, you don't increase capacity or utilization, just by reducing batch size by half, you double. Sorry, by reducing batch size by half, you get a corresponding halving of cycle time. And use the graph. There's the maths. Essentially, if you've got, in this case, we've got two batches, right? We've got a batch that runs from t, t equals zero and to halfway. So you see, imagine that's a batch of work that you've got in your team. And then you, know, you do all the work, it goes through your software development process, and then it sits waiting to go into production on your re release train. Maybe you've got a monthly release train. So you've got work that's sitting there for a month, ready to, ready to be dropped. And then the next time, you've got another bunch of work that's sitting there waiting to be dropped to win money. Your monthly release train. Just by reducing batch size, rather than wait for a month to go into production, if you go in every two days or one day, the, the, the software that you're putting into production after one day is earning money for the whole rest of that time, where it could have been just sitting in a queue waiting to win money. Just by reducing the batch size of getting something into production, this is the concept of something called the cost of delay. Or if you're familiar with bullseye, it's just like the kind of what you could have won prize from bullseye, the old TV show. The cost of delay is how much money could I have made if my software was in production earlier, All right? And the single most effective way of sorting that problem out is by reducing batch size. Batch size reduction can enable us to shorten cycle time, often by an order of magnitude or more, without changing capacity or utilization. You don't have to work harder, you don't have to add more people, and you can double the amount of money you're making just by reducing batch size. That's pretty cool, huh? Going back to the Slack channel earlier, and someone said, Oh, you know, NDC, it's kind of fine. Just make sure you go and get some food during the breaks. Don't wait till lunchtime. NDC sorted the batch size out problem for lunch, right? By having multiple opportunities for people to go and get lunch, they're avoiding the problem of loads of people turning up at once, having that big batch to process. What would NDC do? What would Lego do? In the principles of product development flow, Don Ronaldson, he talks about, I feel like I, I, I know him, so I, I feel like if I say Don, everyone's going to like think you're an ass, right? But I do genuinely know the guy. So Don, what would Don say? Um, in this book, he points out that when you have queues, when you have large batches, which is what, what big queues are, right? Large batches of work sitting, waiting for stuff to happen to them. They, they lead to longer cycle times. They increase risk. The length of time a requirement sits in a queue before it's been worked on, it, the riskier it is because the requirement might change. That thing that said point 2,000, you know, the 2,999th item in your JIRA backlog, like what are the chances that that is actually still wanted by someone, right? Practically zero. There's quite a nice technique, which is you can go in and sort of just delete everything after like 10. <laughs> so you're not going to do it anyway, right? Cues increase risk. They lead to more variability. They lead to more overhead. You have to have more meetings to manage cues. Literally, you, know, you need more project management to manage all the work that's hanging around that isn't in production and new money. 
they tend to lower quality and it leads to less motivated people. How much motivated am I as a developer if I can see the results of my work tomorrow or today than the results of my work in two years' time? Much more motivated, right? This is why queues are so important. What would Lego do? Lego would reduce the batch size. So if you go to a modern Lego kit, they now batch up just the bits you need. So they'll have like the first 10 pages of the manual, they'll just have a bag, number one, for those pages. Massively reduces the batch size, massively increases the, the, the throughput of building a Lego set. That might, you know, might not be the best thing because it's quite fun, right, building Lego. So maybe just buy another Lego set then to, rather than to take longer on the first one. What would Lego do? The other thing they do, and this is fun, is they take advantage of another principle from principles of product development flow, the fluidity principle. This is a direct, has a direct correlation with software architecture, microservices, decoupling and cohesion. They now design their kits in a way that you can build bits in parallel and plug them together afterwards. All right, they've created, they, 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 they created, if you like, an integration mechanism between, standard integration mechanism between bits of their kit. Loose coupling between product subsystems enables small batches. And really microservice services and the idea of having small product teams building decoupled cohesive bits of software around business capabilities, that was about this. It was about creating these decoupled cohesive units that can be worked on independently. Right? So you can scale people around the independent bits rather than have the problem of you know, adding well, you know, the mythical man month, you know, no silver bullet problem of adding more people to a software project, making it last longer. Woo! It worked. So to summarize, understand your system, visualize cues, identify constraints in your system, use the theory of constraints, but understand it's limitations in product development. Remember, we're people, not machines. We can do different things. We don't have to just work on Lego. Finding Lego. <laughs> in my, that's a bit of a Freudian slip. <laughs> Turns out I spend all my time playing with Lego. Use work in progress limits and sorting to help keep throughput high. You know, small, small batches, they directly impact cycle time. If you take anything else away, batch size, work on batch size. Continuous delivery, the reason that continuous delivery is a thing and why build servers and pipelines and so on are such a, were such an advance is because they directly talk to batch size. And embrace anti-fragility, the ability to plug different parts of things together independently and therefore work, to work on them independently. So these are the books, I guess the sources behind a lot of this. Lean Enterprise, Continuous Delivery, Principles of Product Development Flow, uh, shout out to Building Microservices by Sam Newman, the book I should have written but didn't. Um, and to summarize, I leave it with this. Software should be cheap to replace, quick to scale and resilient, and should allow us to go as fast as possible. That was the idea behind building microservices. So when we're thinking about how to scale our teams, how to scale our software, then we should ask ourselves, WWLD, what would, what would Lego do? They would use small batches, that's what Lego would do. So I'm gonna say thank you very much at that point, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be around the rest of the conference. Please come and say hi. Thank you very much. You can take questions for five minutes or so, if there are any. Yes. So, as you work with us, do these principles that you talk about apply from project to project, or as you said, like sometimes the structure of the team affects the way things are done? So, is that really to apply all the projects? So, the question is uh, are these essentially universal across yeah. products, uh, across projects? Yes, absolutely. These concepts are universal across product development, I would say. Um, any team that you work on, there's a reason you've, you come across things like release trains in Scrum or release trains in Safe and so on. Release train is an easy baby step towards reducing batch size. Hey, let's go from a three month batch or three month release cycle, All right, release train. Let's try and work it, work it down to a one month release cycle. That means we've gone from, from a three month batch to a one month, one, one month batch. That's, that's a universal concept across, across pretty much anything. Um, keeping things decoupled so you can scale around the decoupled things, I think is also um, universal. So yeah. And I'll go further than that and I'll, there's a, well, I don't know if you're here on Wednesday morning, you'll have no choice. I'm doing the keynote on, Monday, on Wednesday morning and it's about this. It's actually about the fundamental maths and physics behind why this is a thing. 
Um, there's also elephants in there as well, so it's not, it's, it's not, I'm not just, there's not just maths, it's all right. Well, maybe you like maths, I don't know. Any others? Yeah, well, oh no, there isn't one at the back, damn, quite excited. All right, well, thank you very much then. Enjoy your break and the rest of the conference. I'm James, cheers.